Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture we are going to provide you with additional information on how to transform a source code via an executable program to a running process. So this is information that goes much deeper than the overviews which we have provided in the previous lectures. Now note this is for students who really want to dig a bit deeper here. So Explicitly, this lecture is not relevant for the exam, but still it might help you by uh, giving more detailed explanations so you maybe understand a little better what's going on. So this lecture is rather long, so we split this lecture into three sections. So first we'll talk about the compilation process. So what is the task of a compiler, assembler and linker? How do they interact? And what is the result of all this process? Uh, it's an executable file and on Unix systems it's called an ELF file. This ELF file then can be loaded by the operating system. So there are several operating system components responsible for loading a program, especially the dynamic linker on uh, dynamic loader. And we use additional binary files called shared libraries to create a working uh, executable process. And finally we'll take a look at how a program is actually started after it has been loaded to memory. So essentially there is something before your first instruction in main and we'll take a closer look at what this exactly is. So to compile code you've seen we have this whole procedure here so starting with some C source code which is first handed to our C preprocessor that generates C code with expanded macros and included header files this is then passed to our C compiler and our C compiler can generate assembler code from our C source code. Our assembler code can then be assembled and this generates a single object file, so a binary file containing instructions and data for our processor that was ultimately generated from our C source code file. And we do this for every single C source code file in our project. So in most projects we have more than one source file, so uh, accordingly we have more than one object file. So we have to combine all these object files together. And this is the task of our linker here. So our linker takes all the object files that are related to our binary program we want to generate to our executable. And it may also take additional files, especially libraries, so-called static libraries, which are linked so their contents are actually copied into the executable file which is then stored on disk. So we have an executable file stored on disk here and this stays on disk as long as you need it. And whenever you start a program then the operating system not only reads the executable file directly into memory and executes it, that doesn't work, but there's an additional operating system component called the loader which is responsible for loading our program, allocating memory, putting everything in its correct memory location, and then finally adding possible libraries at runtime, so-called shared libraries, and then finally we can start executing the program. And in today's lecture we are going to uh, go through all this process here step by step. So let's first look at an, ex at an example uh, going from a C file to a single binary object file. So this is just an example for a C file. So you see we include a header file, we have a prototype for some external function to display something, and then we have a main function here. So uh, this main function has some local variables here, it prints some values, and finally it calls display. So display is uh, just implemented below here, so we had our prototype up here, and display then again can print some information to the screen. So first thing we have to do is we have to compile this program. Now you've seen we have several steps like calling a preprocessor, calling the compiler proper itself, calling an assembler, and this would be very tedious if we had to do it all for every source file we want to compile. So the program that's called GCC, for example, for the GCC compiler, but the Clang for the Clang compiler does the same, is actually not the compiler itself. 
but it's a front end to the compiler that calls the single components, so the preprocessor, the compiler itself, and an assembler step by step when compiling a program. So we call GCC, we give it the name of our source code, testproc1.c, and we give it the parameter dash c, which means stop after you compiled the object, uh, generated the object file. If you wouldn't give the object uh, option dash c, GCC would also automatically try to call the linker afterwards. This is not what we want because we want to have a look at what comes out of our compilation process when the object file is generated. So let's compile it and GCC didn't complain about anything so that's always good news so it successfully generated an object file. And by convention if you compile a file named x.c you get an object file x.o as a result and of course the c file stays on disk. So if you list the files in your directory now you see you have a testproc1.c that you've just compiled and you have this generated object file testproc1.0. Now we can check using the file Unix utility what kind of file this testproc1.0 is. So we just enter file and then the name of our object file and we get some output. So testproc1.0 is an ELF 32-bit LSB relocatable Intel 8386 version 1 system 5 not stripped executable file. So this tells us a number of things about the processor architecture this was compiled for, so here, 32-bit Intel processors, the ABI, so which calling conventions were used, System 5 calling conventions. It's uh, LSB, this means it's least significant byte, so it's little endian binary because there are no big endian x86 processors. And finally, it tells us it's an ELF file. Now, what's an ELF file? This is a special file format for executable files, and we'll dig into this deeper in the upcoming slides. So the final option here, not stripped, means it has additional information, especially symbol information, which is needed, for example, for the linker. So if we have any unresolved symbols in our object file, then the linker has to know about these. So it reads this from the additional information. And it can also contain information for a debugger. So for example, when you debug a program, you can display local variables by name. Now. This is just the type of the file. So what's actually inside of that file? So what you could do is you can try to use the cat command. So cat is a Unix command to just output files to the terminal. And you could try cat test proc 1.0. And you would get a whole mess on the screen because test proc 1.0 is a binary file. So to look at a binary file, it's better to use an additional tool and this additional tool for example is hex dump so as the name says it dumps the contents of the file as hexadecimal numbers and hex dump has an additional nice option dash capital c which tells hex dump not only to dump the contents of a file as hexadecimal values here because these are probably hard to read for humans but also give the equivalent ASCII character here on the right hand side. So you see our standard output has an address on the left. So at offset zero in the file, this starts with hexadecimal 7f and has these 16 bytes. Then we have offset hexadecimal 10, so decimal 16, and this has these bytes and so on. And for each line of 16 bytes, we have 16 ASCII characters here on the right hand side. And for each hexadecimal code, which is not printable as an ASCII character, for example, a null character, a hex dump simply prints a dot. And these pipe symbols, these vertical lines, just serve as delimiters here. So we have printable ASCII characters here on the right hand side. Now, wait a bit. If you remember our diagram from the introductory slide, we've said that our C compiler actually generates a sampler source code and this assembler source code is then translated or assembled to the object file to our binary file. So where on earth is our assembler source code? Because we just listed our directory and in the directory listing we saw well there's a C source file, there's an object file, there's no assembler source file. So this assembler source code if it's generated at all, this depends on your compiler, is only generated internally as a temporary file. So it's 
usually just in RAM somewhere between the compiler and assembler, so you're not going to see it. If you want to see the assembler source code uh, that corresponds to your C source file, you can of course do this. And there's another option for GCC to tell GCC, please stop compiling after generating this assembler source code file. And this is the option dash capital S, S for assembler or something. So if you call GCC dash S, with testproc1.c and do an ls. Now you also have a, a simpler source code file, testproc1.s. And if you list the contents, you can do this with cat or open it in an editor. You see some ASCII source file, and this contains some things you might recognize, like a file name here, some names of sections we've discussed before, some strings that have been defined, and down here we have some machine commands. So assembler commands for the x86 processor that correspond to C source code instructions. So our file command told us that the object file that was generated is a so-called ELF file. So ELF file is just an acronym for executable and linking format. And this is the standard executable format introduced by later versions of Unix. So Unix had different executable formats before. So if you look and search on the net, you will find information maybe on other executable formats. The first one is called a.out, and the second one uh, that was also in use, especially in old system five systems for Unix, is called COF, Common Object File Format. So what's inside of an ELF format, uh, ELF format file? So uh, as usual on Unix, it's documented, and it's documented in a main page. So if you call man elf, you get an information, and this man page even contains information about the structure of an elf file. So the structure of an elf file is defined in a header file, and this header file then describes structure for elf files with 32-bit and 64-bit architectures. So for example, here, uh, this shows us, okay, an elf file starts with something, which is a character array called ident, which has a certain length of EIN ident, which is defined as 16. So the first 16 characters are some sort of identifier. Then we have a 16-bit type, which identifies the type of our file. Then we identify the machine of our file, versions, entry addresses, uh, offsets, flags, and so on and so forth. So all of this is contained here, and to be able to execute an ELF file correctly, a compiler has to generate a file that actually conforms to this format. Otherwise, the operating system will reject it and will complain that it's not a valid executable file. So uh, if you try this on Mac OS X, you might not have the ELF man page installed. So on Mac OS X, this uses for historical reason a different executable format called Mac O. So this is very similar in functionality, but different in details. If you're interested in this, we can give you some links on this also. So let's take a look at our hex dump of our test program again. So this is just the object file that we just generated. And if you look at the right hand side, you see, oh yeah, there's three characters ELF. So that might already be an indication that it's an ELF file. Yes, but not quite. So very many files in Unix, and that's how the file utility actually works, contain a so-called magic at the beginning. Well, this is actually not very magic, but a magic in Unix terms is just a character sequence or a sequence of bytes, and this sequence of bytes should serve to uniquely identify a file type. This sometimes works better and sometimes doesn't work as good. Now, for ELF files, this magic is defined uh, to be the first four bytes of the ELF file, and these first four bytes contain, well, the three characters ELF and ASCII, so these three bytes here, but the first byte here is a hexadecimal value 7F. So these four bytes in a sequence 7F and the ASCII representation for the ELF characters define the ELF magic, and that's also what our kernel checks for first when you try to execute an ELF file. So, as you see, the first line here, the whole 16 bytes, are part of this ELF identifier here, which is 16 characters long, so 16 bytes long. So what else is contained in these 16 bytes? 
Now let's take another look at the elf header file here. So this is usually in user include elf.h. And you see the first thing that's defined is elf max, so the elf magic, which is backslash 177 elf. So here backslash 177 is C notation for octal numbers. So octal numbers are base 8 numbers in contrast to hexadecimal numbers, which are base 16. So you will find out that octal 177 is identical to hexadecimal 7f. It's just a different notation. And then we have additional information like the uh, offset of our file class information. So this is a byte offset. So this tells us at a file offset of 4, there's an information about the file class. And the various values for this file class are listed here. So it can be elf class non, that would be an invalid elf file. It can be elf class 32, which means uh, it's a 1 in this position here, or it can be elf class 64, which means it's a 2 in this position here. So we need to differentiate between 32 and 64-bit bin binaries in an elf file, just because a 64-bit binary has larger pointers. So we need to provide more space for pointers inside of the binaries. So if we look at address offset 4, we see this contains the value 1 here. This is that one here. So this value 1, for example, tells us, OK, we just compiled a 32-bit object file. And we have additional information, like the next byte would indicate the machine type and the version. So if the machine type would say it's something different than, for example, an x86 processor, and you try to execute an ARM process or a binary compiled for ARM on an x86 processor, your operating system will complain about trying to execute a binary with the wrong binary machine architecture. So let's take a short excursion to the topic of endianness. So in this elf header file, there are many values defined that actually use more than one byte. So we have 16-bit values, we have 32, and even 64-bit values. We've seen this already before, uh, shortly in the lecture. So the problem is uh, when you write binary files, in which order the bytes of a data type that uses more than 8 bits are actually stored. So uh, for example, we have the decimal number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And to make it easier for us to uh, just keep it in bytes, we say it's a hexadecimal number, and that's our representation here. And you see, we just marked each of the bytes here. So each byte is two hexadecimal characters, so eight bits. And we marked each of the bytes in a different color. So now there are two general ways to store this information in memory. And the first way is to store it in little endian byte order, which means you start writing the bytes from right to left in memory. So at the lowest memory address, you have the least significant byte here, hexadecimal 1.5. At the next memory address 1, you have the CD. Then at address 2, you have 5.8. And at address 3, you have 0.7. So this is an order which is just the other way around to what we are usually used to writing, but it makes certain things actually easier for the computer to do. And the other way for noting stuff is the big endian byte order. This stores the most significant byte first. So we're reading the bytes from left to right and store them in yeah, increasing memory addresses. So address 0 has the byte 7, and then address 1 has that byte here, and so on and so forth. Now, why is this called little and big endian? Well, obviously because of the significance. So you have the least significant versus the most significant byte at the beginning. But these terms actually come from, uh, well, a novel, uh, Gulliver's Travels. No, maybe you've read this in school. And you know, in Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver uh, strands on an island, uh, which is inhabited by uh, people who actually had some really complex society problems. And this mostly revolved around eggs. So in this story, uh, it was told that the people of this island actually used to open their eggs when they wanted to eat them on the big side here. So they were big Indian egg users, but their king had a different opinion and the king actually tried to force the people of this island to open their eggs 
on the other side, so on the smaller side, so on the little endian side. So that's actually this uh, novel where these terms big and little endian came from and they were readily adopted by the computer scientists when this problem showed up early in the 1950s, I suppose, just because it fit so very well. So now let's try to take a look at the inside of an ELF file again. And you've already seen doing this using a hex dump tool. It works. You have to be careful to compare it precisely to the contents of your header file. And if you're just off by one byte, you just read completely strange values, which just don't work. So we want to dissect our ELF file and there's a tool for it because just reading the hex dump output really uh, gets boring after a couple of minutes. So uh, some nice people wrote a tool for it and this tool is called read elf and read elf is just past the name of the elf file to look at. And then when you try it, read elf actually complains usage. So whatever information do you want to have printed on read elf, from read elf about your elf file? And there's some options and one of the options is just dash a for print all of the information you can get. So if we call read elf dash, uh, dot dash a, we get much more information. Now we're only interested in the headers of a file. So we can use the dash h option here and calling read elf dot dash h test proc 1.0 gives you an output like this. So it shows you the elf header. So it shows you the first 16 bytes of your elf magic, which includes the hexadecimal 7f elf bytes it decodes stuff like the elf class so it's elf 32 it has data in little endian two's complement order it has a version of one it has an operating system abi of unix system 5 it's a relocatable file that's important because this is an object file uh, it's compiled for an intel 386 and so on and so forth so that's all detailed information and this information is used by the operating system and by the linker to process this object file further. So if we take a look at the structure of an ELF file, uh, this format obviously is standardized so you can read the standard on this, but in general an ELF file looks like this. We've just seen our ELF header, so this header has general information about the contents of the ELF file and of course it also has the information that it is an ELF file after all. After the ELF header, you have a so-called program header table. And this program header table actually contains links to our various segments of our program. We've seen segments before when discussing, well, the various locations in memory where information ends up. So executable code in our text file. We have seen read-only data. We have seen data and so on. And in addition, at the end of the ELF file, there's a so-called section header table. And the section header table gives more detailed information about each of these sections or segments here, which are part of our ELF file. So all of this is contained in, well, two standards. First is the System 5 application binary interface. And the second one is the ELF standard tool interface standard, which defines the structure of these files. So let's take another look at the uh, object file we just compiled, this time using the dash s option for printing the sections. And it tells us there are 11 section headers starting at a certain offset in the file. And so you can read the names. So there's usually always a null section here, which is just empty. So it has a size of zero. And then you can see the several sections that make up our ELF file. So we have a text section for executable code. So this is a type of program bits. So these are bits part of the program. And this has an offset in a file and it has a certain size here. It also has flags and these flags, for example, tell us the X that should be executable. We have a data segment here, which has a certain size here, which is zero at the moment because we don't have any variables here, which would be W for writable, for example. We have a BSS section. This has no bits because as we've seen, BSS is not stored in the executable file. That should also be writable. We have read-only data here, which has a certain size, and this is not writable. And we have some other sections, for example, some relocation information and some symbol tables and string tables here, 
which we'll discuss in detail later. So here's the key to our flex here. So W for our flex means it's writable, X is executable. This A we've seen means it needs to be allocated by the operating system because we need this information to be stored in memory. And you see all the other sections here. These can be thrown away after loading your executable file because they're not needed to run the program later on. So what is where in our object file? Let's take an example program foo.c here. So this has a constant integer which is initialized to 42 and another regular integer which is initialized to 23 and yet another integer which is uninitialized. So we see if we look at the read elf dump for this object file which we just generated here using GCC that we have a data segment here which now exactly contains four bytes because that's the size for integer variable here and this holds our variable b here and our read only data section is also four bytes in size this holds our constant integer so a read only variable a and we've also seen there's a variable int c which is defined as global so this is a bss variable so bss actually has no size because we know it has to be allocated later on so here it's not contained and here's just a listing of the various sections again but i think you've seen this before so you can look at some details here so elf section details for example give you information about offsets And what you can do here is take a look at the offsets, for example, for your data and BSS section. So your data section has an offset of hexadecimal 60. So if you look into your file at the offset 60, and this is not the offset in memory later on, so it's not a memory address, but really the offset in the ELF file. And you look at address hexadecimal 60, you see it's 17000000. So this is little endian byte order. So Writing it as a regular hexadecimal number, it would be OX17 or decimal 23. So yes, that's our initialized value for one variable here. And the other one, we see you can find it at address hexadecimal 64. So it's just the next four bytes in memory. So these are the bytes 23 and three zeros. So writing it as a regular hexadecimal number would be OX2A. And OX2A is decimal 42. So you see... The uh, initialization values for our writable and constant integer variable are contained here inside of the ELF file. And if you would be an operating system or a linker, you could just check the offsets which are contained in the section headers here and then read the values from the offsets. So how are ELF sections actually represented in assembler code? So in C, we have the idea that program text somehow ends up in our text section and we know where read-only data and regular data and BSS ends up. So let's try to look at assembler code now. So what we do is we call GCC again with the dash capital S option and then we take a look at foo.s. So inside of the assembler source code you see the regular machine instructions like here on the right hand side. You see labels here on the left that indicate symbols so branch targets for example so for example here is just our function main uh, of course that has to be known to our assembler and later on to the operating system and what else is there there's so-called pseudo para uh, pseudo commands or pseudo operations here in the assembler file and that's all of the operations starting with a dot so dot file for example just tells us okay this assembler file was generated from a source code file foo.c and we have something like a global variable a which ends up in section read only data it has to be aligned by four bytes so it has to be stored on an address that's evenly divisible by four and it has a size of four bytes and then we have a itself so this is a label just indicating a storage location for a and this is our init value which is 42 so this is our constant variable over here and the same happens for B. So B is in data. So dot data is just a short form for section data. Uh, it's also aligned by four. It also is used, uh, uses four bytes. And 
this has the initial value of 23. So these here are decimal values compared to hexadecimal values we've seen before. And then you see that the assembler source code can actually refer to these variables here by name. And we somehow have to make sure that this name here, A, B, for example, links actually to the storage location for A and B. So it has to be put into memory somewhere. As I said, you don't need to understand the exact machine instructions that take place here uh, because, well, we're not uh, just providing a course in assembler programming. Uh, this would be interesting uh, for something if you want to do uh, more work in IT security, if you want to do reverse engineering, then you'd obviously have to understand machine language, uh, assembler code, to figure out what, for example, a virus is trying to do to your program. So what we have generated so far is an object file, so a .o file, and these .o files cannot be executed directly. And this is because important parts for a real executable file are missing. So the first thing that's missing is uh, some sort of startup code. So essentially some code that initializes all the things that need to be initialized before our main program can actually run. And this initialization Con, uh, means that variables in the BSS have to be initialized to zero. If you have C++ code, you need to call constructors. Then you need to pass parameters, so you have to provide memory space and pointers for parameters, so our argc and argv, for example, that are passed to main and po potentially our environment here. And finally, of course, we have to jump to our main function. And of course, uh, when we use something like printf, we also have to add libraries, for example, the C standard library libc, before this program can actually be ex successfully executed. Now, one of the problems in an .o file that's additionally uh, just hindering it from being executed is that in a .o file, the addresses of variables and functions are not yet resolved. So there's just a reference that says, okay, if I access something that's called a, there's a reference somewhere in the symbols or in the relocation table that we want to access A, but there's no real address. So this is one of the main tasks of the linker later on to actually provide real addresses for all of the objects when it builds our final executable program. So let's take a look at symbols and addresses in object files. Obviously, the addresses of functions and of global variables have to be known when the program is executed because otherwise it would just be unable to access these functions, so to call the functions and to read or write values to these variables here. And this information is kept in our symbol table. So our symbol table of an ELF file assigns addresses to symbolic names for functions and variables. So uh, if you check the output of read ELF now mit dash lowercase s, then you get the symbols of your program or of your, uh, in this case, just an object file. And here we have a, b and main, for example. And you see the values for these symbols here are all zero. So currently a, b and c, uh, a, b and main are not assigned any valid address. They're set to zero. So these addresses obviously have to be changed to the real addresses in memory when the program is executed. And you have to do this before the program is executed. So this is partially part of the linker's tasks. So the linker is actually passed a list of all the object files that are required to build a program. So the several .o files that were generated from your .c source code files, so generated by a compiler or assembler, but of course, .o files could also be generated by C++ or Fortran or whatever compilers that generate binary code. In addition, you can have so-called archive files, .a files. And archive files are just yeah a collection of object files with a table of contents. So if you have several object files that together have some functionality, so a complex graphics library, which might have several object files to implement the drawing of squares and rectangles and lines and whatsoever, you can combine all of these object files into such an archive file using the AR for archive utility. And this makes it easier for you to build programs because then you only have to give the name of the archive file containing a larger number of object files instead of listing each object file separately. And finally, you can have so-called shared object files, so SO files, uh, 
and shared object files are what we also call dynamic libraries. On Windows, this would be a DLL, dynamic loadable library. So this is also an object file, but uh, compared to .o files and .a files, this is not added to your executable file at link time, so statically inside of your executable, but these SO files are separately stored on disk for the whole system to use. And the idea behind this is that when you use a shared library, such a SO file, that, uh, that it's the same shared library for all the programs. So if you have your C library here, all of your programs can actually rely on the one single SO library file on disk. So that saves a lot of disk space, for example. So uh, the linker then assigns text and data segments of the various .o files to parts of your address space. And this is then used for the OS uh, by the OS for loading the file. So the linker has to resolve the references to op uh, unresolved symbols, so to variables and functions. And the exact address space configuration, for example, is controlled by what we call a linker script, which is a configuration file for our linker. So how does symbol resolution in a linker work? Now, uh, if we look at the symbol table of the link program, we've seen this also contains symbols of all linked libraries, so that's a bit confusing. So now let's really compile a program again. Uh, so now we compile our foo.o program to generate an output executable program foo. So gcc-o means generate an executable called foo here, and then add the following files. And in this case, we have added foo.o. So this indicates to our GCC compiler front end that this is already an object file, so it doesn't have to compile it again. It only has to link it. You could have also given foo.c here on the command line, and then it would have compiled it first to an object file before it tries linking it. So GCC didn't complain here, so let's try read elf again. And if you read, uh, uh, do the read elf again to look at the symbols, now you get a large listing of all the symbols of all the linked libraries. And that's, of course, a bit difficult to read. So here we just show an excerpt. So uh, what we have here now is our variable A and variable B. And now you see, finally, after linking, these have a value. So they have a valid address. So that one here for A and the other one here for B. And also our related function here, main, has a value. And we have some other stuff like an init function here. And we finally also have an address for our BSS variable C. So you've already seen that we can use an alternative to reading the symbol table using readf. And the alternative is to use the nm tool from the GNU bin utils. So if you just compile your program like this, or you have your program compiled from a last slide, and then run nm on your foo binary executable file, you see these codes here, these single character codes, and these indicate the segments in our executable file where the specific symbol ends up. So capital T is a text symbol, capital R is read only, capital D is data, and B means BSS. And here main again is in our text symbol. And on the left hand side, you see the different addresses for all of these symbols here. And if you compare this to your output of read elf, you see, oh yeah, hooray, they match. So it's fine. So obviously, nm and read elf seem to be based on reading the same information. So we can also take a look at our single .o file, which we generated in the beginning. So uh, what we can do here is we can use the object dump tool. This is yet another tool from the GNU bin utils. And object dump takes a binary object file, an elf format, and the dash d parameter means disassemble. So disassembly means the uh, object dump tool reads all of the uh, binary data in our object file and then converts back the hexadecimal opcodes and parameters to human readable assembler source code. And as again, you don't have to understand all the assembler source code. But one thing you see is that these instructions here that somehow move data around, they all have addresses of zero. So one and once in the disassembly here, and also in the original hexadecimal data that was read by our object dump tool. So here, our uh, object dump shows us that really in a non-linked object file here, 
All these addresses are so far unresolved and this means they are set to zero. So to resolve these symbols, our linker then uses a relocation table. This relocation table contains information about the relative location of a given address in the text section or a data section, for example, for addresses that were initialized to zero in the object file. So this is the so-called relocation offset, and it also gives the address length. For example, in our dump here, R38632 means it's a 32-bit offset for a 386 processor. So using the dash R option for read elf, you can see the relocation table. So this is additional information already contained in your object file, which can be used by the linker later on to really patch all the addresses which were set to zero in the object file to the real values that were determined during the linking process. So here you can see different values for different of our symbols like A, B, and C. And finally we can do some resolution here. So we can look at the relocation offset here, uh, which is that one here, and then we can use this relocation offset actually to map this information here. So we see, for example, our variable A here is relocation offset 10. So at address 10 here, so E is that byte here, F is that byte here, and address 10, 11, 12, 13 in hexadecimal obviously would mean that we have our variable A, whereas at address 15 hexadecimal, so this is 14, so 15, 16, 17, and no, 18 in hexadecimal, this would be our variable B. And we have C twice. You may have wondered why this shows up twice because C was referenced twice in our code here, and these are these two locations here. So it offset hexadecimal 1D, so this is 1C, so this is 1D, and it's four bytes again in length. We have a reference to variable C, and again at hexadecimal address 22, so this is the next four bytes here. So this is how our relocation table works. For every occurrence of an address of a variable inside of your binary file, so whenever it's used inside of your machine code, we store a reference to this offset inside of the executable, including its length, in our relocation table. So when our linker then tries to patch up all these addresses to the real value, it can make sure that it didn't, didn't miss any of these. So this relocation table is just part of the object file that's generated by our compiler, uh, for our linker to use later on. So when you finally take a look again at our compiled object file with object dump dash d, you can see at exactly these locations here we have now patched the addresses. So we have real addresses and again this is little endian byte orders so you have to read them from back to front to get the real address here. And so these are now resolved. So we have an address for main so these addresses are now real memory addresses and we have addresses for all of our variables that are referenced. So that was what the linker actually did to create the executable file, among a number of other things, obviously. So let's compare this again to our output of nm. So here we have our resolved yeah, resolutions, our open uh, resolutions that were resolved here. So we know we have variables a, b, and here it's twice c here. And if we compare them again to our nm output, hooray, it fits, it works. They are the same addresses. So actually our linker has done the right thing. So now we've generated a executable file, a binary executable file successfully. So this is the file that's stored on your disk as the output of your compiler and linker phase. And that's exactly what you start when you double click a file uh, icon or when you type the name of an executable file on the command line. That's what the operating system reads. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about the memory that's needed to start a program. And then finally, how a program is actually started.